Welcome back to the channel, you curd nerds. Y'all been hassling me for a commercial check ride for the longest time, and guess what? We got one. And well, during this commercial mock check ride, you're gonna notice down at the bottom of the screen, there's gonna be a duck. It's not gonna be this duck. It's not gonna be this duck. It's actually just another person down there. They wanted to sit in in case they had any other questions. It's their buddy, they're training with them together. So they're trying to do this like paired training so that, well, let's just be honest. They can reduce the cost. So this uh, commercial check ride is going to be based on a technologically advanced aircraft as opposed to a complex aircraft. So what this means is even though this student is going to get a commercial certificate, they're still not going to be qualified to fly anything with a constant speed prop, flaps, and retractable gear. They're doing this in an SR-20, an SR-20 Cirrus that actually just has a power lever as opposed to a throttle, prop, and mixture. It just has a combined power lever and mixture lever where it adjusts the prop and the throttle together. It's it's kind of weird, but um, let's get into it. Why can't I snap? There we go. Let's get into it. <laughs> now, before we get into the mock check, right, I want to say a special thanks to our sponsor, HelloFresh. Now, I know as an airline pilot, the last thing you want to do after getting home from a three, four, five day trip is go grocery shopping, <laughs> building meal plans, building a grocery list, following recipes that you found on Reddit. That's, that's the last thing I want to do when I get home from a three or four day trip. So I would like to recommend HelloFresh. And if you use the link down below, you'll get 16 free meals along with dessert for life, as long as you maintain an active description. So go down there, use the link in the uh, description and get a pretty good deal on HelloFresh. Uh, so I just would like to ask before we get anything going, are you okay with me recording this, uh, using it for Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, you know, any other weird social medias that might come out soon, given that TikTok might not be around for much longer. <laughs> yep. That's all good. All right. Yes, what about sir. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so that's all recording. So I'd like to get into, um, pretty much the way a check ride is going to go. I mean, you've gone through a check ride, right? So you know how DPE or this would be your third one at this point. So technically, so we're at a 141 school, so this will be my first DPE check. Okay, so, um, but you've taken a yes. stage check for, you've taken a stage check for private pilot, you've taken a stage check for instrument, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, for a DPE, it's not that much different. Um, you're st if you've got like a standardization manual for your school, they might not know that very well. Um, but again, this is your deep that the DPE you're working with might, you know, have dug through that standardization manual. They might be comfortable with your school. They definitely have because they kind of indirectly work for our school. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well just right off the bat, you know, obviously we're going to ask for all of your documentation, right? We're going to ask for your certificates, medical certificate, log book to make sure you have the appropriate endorsements. If you're curious about what endorsements you need, go look at advisory circular 61 dash 65 H in the appendix in the back. And that's going to, you know, that appendix is really breaks it down. Barney style is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, beyond that, um, have you read the ACS and you understand the standards that you're being held to? I do. Yes. All right. So we've got three different outcomes for every check ride. Uh, we've got satisfactory, unsatisfactory, and incomplete. Satisfactory means that you are consistently within the standards. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a you are always in the standards. And it also doesn't necessarily understand that you answer every question. Okay. It means that you are consistently within the standards. And if you don't know the answer to a question, you know what source to go find it in. All right. Then we've got unsatisfactory. This would be, um, danger of <clears throat> damaging the aircraft, damaging somebody else, damaging uh, other property, violation of uh, regulations, violation of uh, federal aviation regulations, which is hilarious because I actually had one of my personal students go get a pilot deviation on their commercial check and they still passed. And I argued with the DPE for like an hour about it. They passed. <laughs> yeah. And he still passed. I was like, wait, what? Um, but Unsatisfactory is obviously an option, right? Um, you're not within the standards. You don't consistently meet the standards. Uh, commercial, you know, you've got that power off 180. Um, you also have your short field, right? Remember, if you're going to end up short, go around. If you're going to end up long, I mean, go around, right? But if you're going to end up short, you know, definitely go around, right? Um, 
standards are a little tighter. Okay. Then we've got incomplete. These are things like illness. Um, you know, pretty anything that would be on like the I'm safe checklist, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the aircraft is unairworthy weather outside of either your personal limitations or the aircraft's limitations, um, or anything that would impact the safety of flight. Right. Right. All right. Um, if you want to look at the exact regulation that, that breaks down why an incomplete would be appropriate, I think it's 6143 Bravo. Okay. All right. Cool. So without further ado, I like to get straight into systems. Cause if you don't understand your aircraft, the rest of it's probably not going to go that well either way. Sounds right. good. Um, so just what engine do you have? So we have a Teledyne Continental IO360 ES engine. Um, the I is fuel injected. O is horizontally opposed. And it's 360 cubic inches of displacement in the engine. Um, it's six cylinder horizontally opposed. It's fuel injected. Um, it's normally aspirated um, and it's air cooled. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, how much power? Yep, so 200 horsepower at 2,700 RPM. All right. Um, this thing's a little, uh, this one's almost like a poor man's Cirrus because it doesn't have FADEC, right? It doesn't have uh, full authority direct engine control. Um, no. So with that in mind, what does it use for an ignition system? So we just use the magnetos. Yep, Mag so let's go. Got magnetos, right? How much oil is the recommended minimum for this? So the PUH states five quarts. Our school policy is six. Okay, maybe I read that wrong. Because um, I said, or what I saw was six is the minimum mm -hmm. recommended, right? But okay. it reads seven on the stick. Because one okay. quart is in the uh, oil filter. Correct. All right. Um, um, but again, that might I might have been reading the wrong POH, to be honest. You know, I do a bunch of these in a day, and none of them okay. are on the same airplane. <laughs> so <laughs> that one might be on me. All right. So what weight of oil would I recommend it would be recommended to use if I flew this aircraft in let's say Canada, right? Cuz you've got a it can take a wide range of oil, right? Yes, it can. Mm -hmm. All right. Um I know that's kind of an odd question. Most people don't know it off the top of their head. Would you know where to find it? So I mean, in our POH we have it it's actually I believe in section 1. Mm -hmm. It's actually just little uh, under engine summary, which would be section one dash six, I believe it talks about the oil on the next page. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So like it's got a temperature range in which appropriate oils oh, yeah. would be appropriate. Yeah. All right. So you know where to find it. Let's say you get to Podunk Nowhere Airport and there's no hundred low lead. Is there any other kind of gas that you could use? We could use a hundred. All right. What Just... color is that? So that's going to be green. Awesome. Um, now, tell me about this thing's propeller. Now, before I ask that, do you have a prop lever? We do not. Okay. It's so. all time problem. <laughs> yep. So then we'll continue on, right? Tell me about your propeller. So we have two different kinds of propeller. We have a three blade and we have a two blade. They're a Hazel brand and they're aluminum alloy build. So the three blade is going to be between um, the ranges on the on that propeller are between 72 and 74 inches on the three or on the two blade. Sorry, it's going to be between 73 and 76 inches. OK, um, I'm more getting into the into um, tell me about a constant speed prop, because that's okay. really what the limitation yeah. is, right? So we have a constant speed propeller. So we have a propeller governor now that is completely attached to our throttle. Um, via me a mechanical linkage. There's no electronic control in there. Um, it's all mechanical. Um, and when we increase power, it decreases the oil flow throughout the propeller and it decreases our pitch. Okay. Um, now, let's say, because again, you know, being commercial, it's not necessarily commercial in an SR20. It means that you can go hop in any airplane that's technically complex, right? Um, well, you might still need a complex endorsement, actually. I would still need a complex. You would still need a complex endorsement. All right. Well, we'll move on then. Uh, what's going to happen in the event of an engine failure? Where's the oil going to go? So it's going to go out of the propeller and kind of go to the lowest point, I believe. So around. It's going to leave the hub. Yeah. That's the end of the question. It's going to leave the hub. Okay. And what's it going to do to the, the pitch? 
It's going to um, decrease the pitch. All right. Allowing you to what? It's kind of like a, almost like a feather almost, I believe. Um, you're going the, really... you're going the wrong direction. It's going to okay. lower, it's going to lower the pitch, causing it which, to go to oh. a higher RPM, yep. which allows you to attempt what? A power off landing a or restart. A restart. Yeah. It's going to allow you to start a restart. Cause if you feather it, you're not going to restart it. Have you ever tried to I don't actually have feathering? So I don't know why I said yeah. that. Um, have you done any multi-engine training yet? I've not. No, no. Okay. Um, well Soon. you can't reset a feathered like, unless okay. you've got an anti feathering accumulator, you're not restarting a feathered airplane. All right. I've, I've had to land a commit a twin Comanche. Um, because I, you know, when you're doing multi-engine training, you have to, you have, you have to show a shutdown and well, it didn't <laughs> the prop feathered and we couldn't get it out of feather. Um, so we actually had to land. Right. Are there any hydraulics on this airplane? So the only hydraulics we have is our braking system. Awesome. So this one's electrical systems, a little complex, isn't it? Tell me a little bit it about is. it. So unlike most single engine, smaller planes, we actually have two alternators and I guess technically three batteries. Um, so we have alternator one, which powers our essential bus. And also we have a diode, which allows that to flow into our essential bus from the main bus. So that alternator is um, 20 volts at 75 amps. Um, and then our second alternator cannot flow to the main bus. It can only flow to the essential bus. So in the event of an electrical issue, all the power pretty much flows to our essential gear. Um, that is 28.75 volts at 20 amps. Um, okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah. What are you going to still have? Let's say you have a main alternator failure. What instrumentation are you going to keep? What? equipment are you going to keep so we're going to keep our main instrumentation our pfd so it's going to be our attitude or heading stuff like that we're also going to keep our stall warning horn we're going to keep nav one com one um and then obviously our ada hearse system that provides that stuff data to the pfd all right so i want you to go track down um the chart and tell me if you keep nav one Oops, sorry, you cut out there a little bit. I, I was saying, tell me if you keep Nav 1, because when I read through your chart, I didn't see Nav 1 being powered. I saw GPS 1 being powered. Oh, I believe it says, let me find. Um, I would second that it's GPS 1. It is GPS 1? Okay, <laughs> that's my bad then. Okay, then well, then you know. That's, that's kind of why we do these things, right? GPS one is the one that's being powered. And it's important that you recognize that because what if you need to use an ILS, right? What if right. you're like, oh, well, hey, I'm going to divert to this airport that only has an ILS, right? You got to use GPS. You're going to be using GPS. Can you do a G Can you use GPS in lieu of an ILS? You cannot. No, no right? So why it's really important what instrumentation do you still have obviously you've got is it navadine or g1000 avidine well i think in an avidine they put the red x's over the navs that you lose when you lose them yeah, yeah. so i mean you're gonna you're gonna see it on the screen um but it's still good to know right um now what would you do right so there is some checklist procedures that you can run through uh in the event that you do lose alternator one um, you know what those are? Is there a way, is there like a process to try and get alternator one back up? So the main one is just trying to reset the circuit breaker. If that was, um, switched, um, we could also just try turning it on and back off. Sometimes that works. Um, seeing if it, the circuit breaker trip, trying the trip, push that back in our school allows for us to push it in once. And if it resets again, then we cannot push it back in again. So we could try a circuit, a circuit breaker reset. Other than that, that's pretty much all we can do. Yeah, I mean, that's about it. The only thing I'd say is your POH specifically says to turn the master for that alternator off first. Right. Um, just make sure you do that because what you don't want, you don't want the voltage or the amperage spike to be in the circuit breaker. Right. Because um, they're a lot of times they're not shielded. Um, you know, they're, they're intended to pop in the, the event of some kind of electrical malfunction, right? 
Right. Um, so in your POH, it'll, it uses the, the terms land as soon as practical and land as soon as possible. What, is, what does that mean? What is the difference between that statement to you? So it's kind of used just, I mean, for instance, like an electrical failure, it may not be like a necessity to declare an emergency in the gr get in the ground absolutely as soon as possible. I mean, we have two batteries. They last for about 30 minutes each. So we have about 30 minutes of electrical power plus two alternators. So if we lose one, we're not going to declare an emergency in that point. So just getting on the suit on the ground, not like dilly-dallying almost. And then land as soon as practical, we have, you know, maybe all of our electrical systems have completely turned off or something. <laughs> we're getting on the ground as soon as possible. So the, the, the best way that I've seen people explain it is land as soon as possible means that there is imminent danger of the aircraft life, limb, or eyesight. Okay. Right? If I have right. a, com even if I have a complete electrical failure, is the airplane going to fall out of the sky? No, no. <laughs> right? No. Um, a, a, a fancier Cirrus, one with Fadec, yeah, it'll fall out of the sky in about 45 minutes. Um, but then you just pull the chute, right? <laughs> but um, land as soon as practical means that there is a degradation of a safety margin. And I need to take the airplane to somewhere where it would be reasonable to either land or get it repaired. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Land as soon as possible is like, shit, if I keep this airplane in the air, there's going to be imminent danger of life, limb, or eyesight. And that's more probably engine related for us, I would assume. It's fire. Says fire, <laughs> engine fire. roughness, stuff yeah. like that. You know, fire, roughness, uh, exceeding, G exceeding load limitations of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Right. Exceeding load limitations of the aircraft. I'm going to find the closest pavement I can you know, right. the closest airport I can, right? If I know that this airplane has well exceeded its limitations, I don't want to take this thing home. I want to get out of it and right. bring me an airplane that yeah. probably still has spars that are in one piece. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's stuff like that, right? So if you did have a complete electrical failure, what kind of uh, control surfaces would you lose? So we'd literally just lose our trim. That would be it. Do your flat? You got a Johnson bar oh, in your airplane? So we, we lose our flaps as well. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And again, it's good to keep that in mind because you, what you don't want to do is be like buzzing to the airport in the event of an electrical failure and go, "All right, flaps want." Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No uh, flap landing on my stage check. What was uh, up? I did a no flap landing on my stage check. Oh, you're gonna <laughs> do a no flap landing in every single type rating you ever get. That's where most people fail the CRJ 200 type. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough, right? So what axis do you have on trim or what axis is control are controllable with trim? So we got roll and pitch. All right. Yeah. You've got yaw. It's adjustable on the ground as well. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you can't do that. Yeah. All right. Um, what are you going to do if you have a trim runaway or an uncommanded roll or pitching moment with the autopilot off? So with the autopilot all off, we're going to immediately pull the circuit breakers for the trim. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, control yoke land as soon as practical again. All right. So let's get into your instrumentation, right? You've got your glass and then you've got your backups. Let's talk about your glass to begin with. Uh, where does your glass get its information from? Where does your attitude and heading and all those things? We have an ADA Hurst system. So that's a combination of the ADC in the air system. So mm -hmm. the air computer and the air, um, attitude ref heading reference system. So it's a combination of the two. All right. Now, in probably in a Cessna that you flew or Piper or what have you ages ago, you had to make corrections on your cross country plan for magnetic deviation, right? I, a, I put a G1000 for. Oh, <laughs> fine. Whatever. <Cessna. laughs> <laughs> then we'll, we'll continue on. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's get into some limitations of the aircraft. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, what's the max demonstrated crosswind in this aircraft? 21 knots. Is that, is that a limitation? It's not a limitation. It's a demonstration. All right. So um, go figure it out what it is. I, I know what it is in my airplane. It's 27. It's, 27. Fucking, it's fucking terrifying when, when you figure that out. Because <laughs> you're like all the aileron, all the rudder, and you're like, wait a minute. We're still. <laughs> We're still drifting. <laughs> it's like wind check, 
27. All right. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> um, let me write, let me scribble that in my POH real quick. No, I'm kidding. Uh, what's VNE? VNE is 200. 200. All right. Uh, what about VNO? 165. When can I exceed VNO? Smooth air. Awesome. What's VO? VO is basically our version of VA. Um, All right. It's our, de- it's our, I believe it's, I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but it's just our maneuvering speed, basically. No, for some reason it calls it an operational maneuvering speed, but then it has other maneuvering speeds referenced in the emergency yeah. section of your POH. So I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Um, <laughs> But let's look at VO. What does VO allow? Like what, what, is, what does it protect you from? So basically it allows us one full movement of a flight control system and we will stall before breaking the aircraft below that speed. Awesome. So why does it change with weight? So as weight increases, we have to f- add more back pressure to uh, account for that weight. Um, as we do that, are we fly closer to that critical angle of attack, which is the angle that the aircraft will always stall. So as a force is applied, we are more likely to will stall quicker as we are closer to that critical angle of attack than we would if we were lighter. And that just basically allows us that maneuvering speed. Yeah. All right. Now, what if I stomp on the rudder? Is the aircraft going to stall before it damages? Uh, if we're below VA, I would assume it would not. Well, it's not going to stall, but you're still just not going to damage the airplane. Can right. I dance on the rudder? <laughs> Probably not, no, because it no, doesn't no. one fall. So, no. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a, what was it American? I think it was American 954 back from the 90s. They snapped the tail off. Um, Great. They were below maneuvering speed, though. <laughs> All right. What's VFE for 50% flaps? 50%, so it would be 120. All right, 100%? 100. Um, what is the maximum recommended speed for a caps pull? 135. All right. Is there any limitations on power setting while you're doing an approach? So it depends on... It's an ILS. Color, I believe, and it's... I believe it's 2,600 RPM. Yep, 2,600 RPM, right? So... Talk me through an engine relight or restart in flight. So the first procedure, obviously, upon an engine failing would be to one pitch for best glide, then find our best place to land. As we're doing that, we're going to attempt to we'll go mixture full forward. We'll go our engine pump on. So that would be in boost mode. We would switch tanks, make sure. There is fuel flowing there. If all that doesn't work, then we'll attempt to restart the engine, which would just, if the propeller is not already spinning, then we'll just go ahead and crank it with the key. And if all that doesn't work, then we'll just shut off every equipment and land um, in our field or wherever. All right. Only other thing, uh, power half inch. Power half inch, okay. Right, Um, because if you had it up at cruise you could very likely be flooding the engine without it, without it starting. Right. Cause your throttle is going to control some level of fuel right. that's getting into it. Right. And if you've got mixed or full rich, full throttle on an engine, that's barely spinning or not igniting, right? Right. you're definitely not going to get it back. Okay. Um, so just all the way through the checklist. Right. Um, <clears throat> what's the plan if your wing catches fire? So we're going to go ahead and turn off all the lights on that wing. So our nav position lights. Um, we are then going to do a side slip with that wing as the high wing. And land probably in a field <laughs> or a road. <laughs> land as soon as possible. I'm not, you're not going to go to the airport with that. <laughs> no. Um, again, just make sure you don't forget the uh, pedo heat, right? I know you're probably not out there flying around with the pedo heat on because you're not nice in conditions. Correct. Right? But if you're below 40 degrees Fahrenheit in IFR, I'd probably have my pedo heat on. Right. Um, last thing you want to do is not be able to get a fire out because you're not running through the checklist in the order is appropriate. I know you're probably never touching that pedo heat switch. It's probably a, a dusty switch in your airplane. Right. Um, we both fly in Florida as well. So, yep. So, <laughs> but just make sure you, you touch yeah. on all of them. Right. Yep. 
Um, now, <laughs> this one's hilarious. Uh, what's the serious approved way to deal with spins? Caps. <laughs> yep. All right. So talk me through a caps activation as if I was a passenger. Or sorry, no. Just talk me through a caps um, a, a, a caps activation. Not necessarily as I'm a passenger, but. So a caps activation, we want to try to slow down to the slowest speed possible. Um, if not, we're just going to pull the cap. So that involves just pulling it out of its cartridge, kind of like a pop, and then smoothly piling down force on it until it releases the par parachute rocket. And then turning everything off when we get a chance to prepare for our emergency landing, pretty much. All right. So describe to me the emergency landing position as if I was a passenger, right? So you're trying to be a commercial pilot. You can fly this thing commercially. I'm a dumb, dumb passenger. Oh my God, we're going to die. Was that a parachute? Why does this airplane have a parachute? Talk me through the position that I need to, to be in to make sure that I'm not going to die when we hit the ground. Oh, I'm trying to remember this one. So I've, it's laid back in your seat and I believe it's cross your arms like this, I think. Just kind of in a brace position like that. We don't lean forward or anything like that. We just stay in that position. Now, I'm not saying tell me as an instructor. I'm saying tell me as a passenger, right? Okay. Have that level of assertiveness yep. to be able to explain that. You need to sit back, cross your arms, hold yourself into your chair, sit up straight. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the, the that's the kind of risk. Us, sorry. I believe no, the school ahead. tells us to um, hand over wrist on the lab for impact. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Oh, I'm just following the POH. Uh, if your school says something else, I mean, yeah, I'm just I, I, I love POHs because it's like I'm not wrong. The POH is. <laughs> um, so how much force would you expect to have to pull on that caps handle? I believe it's, I don't know exactly how many pounds it is, but I believe it could be upwards of like 20-ish pounds, I think. It's 45. 45. Yeah. So they actually reference, in, again, in the POH that a chin-up style maneuver is the uh, recommended way to pull on that handle, as in like grab the handle and chin up. Right? Because, so you know, 45 pounds, like that's half of what my wife weighs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how many G's can you expect to experience from a caps activation? I do not know that one. It's going to be um, up to three G's. To three and that G's. is saying that you are pulling it from straight and level flight. All right. If you're pulling it from anything other than straight and level flight, you could experience more. All right. And these are, these are things to know as right. a commercial pilot. Like you need to be able to explain these things in a, in a calm, cool, yet assertive manner this is what's going to happen. We are going to be fine, but this is what's going to happen. And this is what you need to do to ensure that you are fine. All right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even when I'm out flying around in my seaplane for fun and bringing passengers with me that have never been in a seaplane, you know, sure. We're out there having fun. We're probably going fishing, but there's still the, the spot that you kind of stop and you're like, Hey, these are the emergencies. This is what could happen. This is what we're going to do to maintain safe. And I've got to tell them like, hey, if we crash, the wings are going to break off and you're going to go climb on the wing. If you can grab the yellow box to my left, which is the ELT, grab it. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. um, it's probably terrifying because you're like, shit, I just wanted to go fishing. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> right. All right. Um, but these are the things it's like a commercial pilot and, you know, we're, we're starting to get more privileges. We need to make sure that we can explain, um, the limitations and emergency operations of an aircraft, right? You know how a flight attendant goes through their whole safety briefing. That is a part 91 requirement for commercial operations. Okay. They're not just there to be honest. It seems ridiculous, but even for you, when you start carrying passengers, you need to make sure your passengers understand, um, the emergency operations, the emergency equipment, the exits, all that jazz. All right. Yep. So let's get into some airworthiness, right? What documents are required uh, for just a normal VFR day in this aircraft? So documents. So that's going to be any supplements that we may have, um, airworthiness, uh, certificates, registration, um, radio station license, assuming we're flying outside the U S um, our POH, 
and our weight and balance specific to our aircraft. Awesome. Awesome. So if I gave you the maintenance book of this airplane, right? If I just gave you its maintenance log, what are you looking for to make sure that uh, it's legal and safe? So within the maintenance log, we're mostly looking for our inspections. So that's going to be our NEADs. We have to make sure we're complying with the NEADs, our life limited parts as well. Um, we're going with VOFR, so our VOR inspections not required. Um, then our hundred hour and our annual are both required. Um, we'll need our static or health timber and static inspection every twenty four calendar months. Make sure we got that. Um, then we'll need our transponder every twenty four calendar months as well, and then our ELT. All right, so. Here's the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you've, yeah, that's great. I don't know where I was going with that. Um, if you have, if you just go and buy yourself a Cirrus, right? You too, you know, you, you guys hit the lottery, you go buy an SR22. Congratulations. Yay. Do I have an applause button? No, I don't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, what inspections are you guys required to have? Or I guess what inspection do you not have to do? Basically the hundred. All right. Now, if you start renting it out, you need that hundred hour, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's say you two buy the airplane and you want to receive more instruction in it. Do you need a hundred hour inspection? So if I'm receiving instruction. It's not, I don't believe it's being put out for hire. So I don't think it would need it. Nope. It's still your airplane, right? It doesn't need to be you. It's not being used for commercial services, right? Um, so you walk up to this airplane, it's got some stand, uh, standby uh, instrumentation, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's say that attitude indicator just won't, the standby attitude indicator is just dead. It's just bloop, won't ever stand back up. Is this airplane airworthy? It is airworthy. All so right. the process, so this is 91213. Our school also has their own flow chart they make us use. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. I think I know which flow chart you're talking about. It's technically one from Embry Riddle, but every other flight school just takes Embry Riddle's branding off of it. it possibly. <laughs> it's it, it's pretty funny. Okay. I've I've seen it many many times. Um, I honestly, I'm gonna say it's actually probably ours. Oh really? Oh. Oh yeah, I guess that might be ours. Yeah. All right. So, we start with. The KOEL, so the kinds of operation equipment list, that's going to be in our POH. It does not require it. Um, if no, then we go to if it's required by our type certificate. So that we can find on Google. I know it's not. <laughs> and then if no, we're going to go to any ADs, see if any ADs require it. it. Does not. And if no, we're going to go to equipment by 91205. So an attitude is not required, the 91205. And then this equipment must be removed or placarded. We are not going to remove it, so we are just going to placard. All right, and removed, then, placarded, obviously. and, uh, you know, dis disabled, right? Yep. Awesome. And then, obviously, as PIC, you determine if it's still safe to fly. All right. Are you going to go fly an air? Are you going to go fly a Cirrus with a dead attitude indicator? A dead standby in VFR conditions? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't even be concerned if I... My airplane's attitude indicator, it falls over periodically. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. VFR day. Um, yeah, you got a, you have a much bigger attitude indicator out your front window. Um, yep. Now, do you need a landing light? So we are a four higher air, airplane, so we do at night. Awesome. Awesome. Um, does it need to be on? So it needs to be on from the hours of... Sunset to sunrise, I guess the landing light does not need to be on, but the position and nav lights do. All right. Now, here's a here's a perfect learning example, or perfect bit for learning, right, when it comes to check rides. Did I ask anything about your position and nav lights? Did not. No. Ne <laughs> never miss an opportunity to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I, yep. Right? You've taken a couple check rides, right? Don't dig yourself a hole. It's like, oh, between Civil Twilight and between, wait, what, what's all that? Let's talk about that now. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, it's awesome that you know that you've got that flow chart. I just make sure you go read 91.213 as well. Make sure you actually fully yeah. understand 91.213 because that uh, that flow chart didn't reference anything about an MME, uh, MEL and MMEL. So right? We do have two flow charts. We have the MEL flow chart and the non-MEL, but obviously our aircraft does not have an MEL. So, Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, airworthiness is pretty solid. I mean, you've been doing it for a little while, so I mean, I, I wouldn't be concerned. I shouldn't be concerned. All right. <laughs> yeah. So as a commercial pilot, what changes? So pretty much you can get paid to fly. I mean, that's the big one that changes. All right. You know, as the, as the regs write it, you can carry passengers or cargo for compensation or higher, right? Yep. Uh, how does the FAA define compensation? So compensation, it has to do based off a common purpose. So if you and your passenger do not have a common purpose when going to a place, that is considered compensation or higher. All right. Um, so that's awesome. There's not there. You you touched on that common purpose, right? So flight time, right? I know mm -hmm. a lot of people get pissed off about it. You know, even I get pissed off about it because flight schools try to say it's like, oh well, we're getting you hours. Eat me. I'm a flight instructor. Pay me. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But according to the FAA, uh, flight instruction, is, or not flight instruction, um, flight time is compensation, right? So congratulations, you passed your commercial pilot's license. Now you're going to start posting on TikTok and Instagram all over the place that you're going to, you're going to start flying people from point A to point B for like 50 bucks, right? Mm, are oh, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> you're not what, would, that. what would that count as? That'd be holding out. All right. Which would result in what? Uh, common carriage, common carriage. Right. Awesome. Now let's say your mom comes to visit you, right? She comes and is like, Oh my God, my little boy, he's a commercial pilot. I'm so proud of him. So she flies out there, right? Um, she flies into your local Bravo airport, gets a rental car. Like we all do. Cause you know, public transit transit's terrible in this country. Um, and then she comes out there, you guys go flying around. She's like, I'm just going to return my rental car out here and you can fly me back to whatever Bravo airspace. Uh, I'll give yeah. you like a hundred dollars for gas. Is that, is that okay? So that would be fine as I did not hold out. And I guess it depends where the plane come from, comes from in that circumstance. Um, so the plane's coming from the school. The school is not going to rent the airplane to her. The school is going to wet lease the aircraft to you and you so would be providing would transportation. That would not be legal. What would that qualify as? Um, you'd be, that would be air care, not air carrier, but um, what's the term? It's the one. What's the opposite of common carriage? <laughs> Private carriage. Yeah. Right. You didn't hold out to the public. That's li that's really the only difference between common and, and private right. Car carriage, right? Did you hold out to the public just because it's your mom? Y'all don't have a common car common purpose. Even if that hundred dollars is less than the pro rate of share, she's still paying you to take you from point A to point B right. or take her from point A to point B. Now, let's say you're both getting on that airplane. The, 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 like you're both ending up at this Bravo air sport airspace or airport to then both of you get on an airplane and fly somewhere else. Common purpose, right? Common purpose. Yep. Um, <clears throat> now can you offer tours? Yep. So 91 or sorry, 119.1 E lists a whole bunch of exemptions in air tours. There's a couple exemptions for or requirements to do air tours, but yes, you can offer air tours. All right. It's you can offer air tours without a operator certificate is really the, the full answer. Right. Cause it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, sure. Back in like, I think it was like 2012 prior to 2012, you could just go buy an airplane, get a hundred hour on it and start offering tours. There was no real, like it was <laughs> nice. Like, yeah. Um, but now there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot. Right. So you're out on a field, you're out on the airport, right? And a Lear, somebody who owns a Learjet offers to pay for your training and, uh, you'll be their private pilot. What would you want to look for to ensure that you are always operating legally? So you would want to make sure they have the operations certificate from the FAA. Do they need an operator certificate? It's just their private. It's just them privately. Like, Hey, I lost my medical. Come fly my airplane for me. So 
I guess as long as they have their hundred hour, I believe that's legal. All right. Now let's say a bunch of, but what are you going to start looking for? What would make you concerned if you are, if this person might actually need an operator certificate? So I guess it'd be based off the amount of contracts. Um, is that kind of where you're going with that? I guess I'm no, not really what, what I'm going with is, uh, you need to ensure that they're not offering the services to the public or the private for a fee. So if you hear somebody, if you're flying yeah. along and you hear somebody in the back seat, like, yo, I can't believe I only had to pay hundred dollars for this. You're like, Oh shit. That. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. All right. Um, cause like, I'm not trying to say that people do shady shit, but like people do shady shit. Yeah. All right. And guess who's in trouble. Guess who's in trouble if they get wrapped oh, up in some shady shit like that. Right. Yep. Um, now congrats. You have your IFR certificate, correct? I do. Now let's say you don't maintain your currency. You don't go get an IPC. What are you now? Lim what's your limit now? So I'm limited when carrying passengers, I'm limited to 50 nautical miles during the day and no night flying with passengers. Awesome. Awesome. They want to make sure that you're not, that, you know, you're not going to get people killed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, now let's say you're at, uh, Delta airspace. All right. Weather's looking at like two mile visibility, 2000 foot ceilings. Um, you lost your IFR currency. Is there anything you can do to, I don't know, get out to an area in which the weather's pretty, in which the weather's kind of clear. Yeah. So I can request a special VFR. All right. Um, let's get in some aerodynamics for a bit. Did you have a nav log? I forget. I did. I sent you one. Yeah. All right. We'll dig into that in a second. Um, sure. we'll go through some aerodynamics and then we'll dig into your nav log. I don't think there was much in it that I was too concerned about. Um, but let's talk about flaps. What are flaps going to do for us? So it is going to basically change the shape of the wing. So it's going to increase our angle of attack um, and it's going to increase lift at slower airspeeds. So the reason we more or less have them is to allow us a steeper descent at slower airspeeds. All right. Um, <clears throat> another thing you can do, you know, this, you, you want to go get some actual Canyon fly Canyon, you know, training before you really go and do this. Uh, flaps can help tighten up your turn without increasing your load factor as much in a turn. Right. Um, cause remember for me to, for me to generate enough downforce or for me to actually tighten up a turn, I need to generate downforce on the tail, right? That's increasing the drag. That's increasing load factor. It's increasing the induced lift and drag that's generated by the tail, right? It's burning more energy. But if I drop my flaps, all that's going to do is increase my lift helping me pull through the turn as opposed to drive through the turn. Right. Interesting. Um, go get real box Canyon, go get real, you know, mountain flying training before you try shit like that. Uh, <laughs> but it just really makes you think of like, okay, how are flaps actually working? Mm -hmm. right? right. What are flaps actually doing aerodynamically? Uh, talk to me about a stall. What's a stall. So a stall is basically when we reach the critical angle of attack, we stall. But basically what that is, is, the wings are not producing enough lift to maintain flight. So oh. you fall <laughs> kind of. Well, okay. So let's look at this. I, I know you're not necessarily in a swept wing aircraft, but if we look at the, the coefficient of lift profile of a swept wing aircraft versus a straight wing aircraft, um, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of falling, right? It's well, a matter of not necessarily yeah. keeping enough lift in every airplane you've flown so far. When you stall it, the nose breaks. Correct. Right. Yes. Um, there is no if, ands, or buts about it. You're going to stall it, nose breaks. You start getting into swept wing aircraft, though. Um, you could be well deep into a stall and the nose still be pointed at the sky because swept right. wing. All right. So don't, I just wanted to catch that one yeah, yeah. part that like you're not immediately falling always. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's my concerns if I stall in an uncoordinated? Well, let me rephrase that. What's, what is uncoordination? Uncoordination is basically when you have basically either too much centrifugal forces kind of blowing toward the outside of the turn or not enough towards the inside of the turn. So you're not a nice rounded turn. You're kind of slipping or skidding. All right. Easier way to think of it. Where's the tail in relation to the nose? Mm -hmm. Is the tail behind the nose? Right. That is coordination. Right. 
Um, mm. Yes, the skidding, the slipping and sliding and all that, correct. Um, I say the easier way to think of it is, is the tail tracking behind the nose? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so what is some concerns if I stall in an uncoordinated fashion? Spinning. Right. So spinning. Talk me through a spin. So the spin, you're going to have to start with the entry. So you're going to start kind of nosing over. Then you have the, I'm going to try to pronounce this, in, incipient. 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 And then you have the fully developed. So that's when you're fully turning. And then you have your recovery. So those are like the four parts of a spin. All right. So in the incipient phase, right? So that's where we get that uncoordinated stall. Or not the mm -hmm. incipient, but the... Entry, so, that's our uncoordinated stall in the incipient phase. But how many rotations is that going to, uh, is that going to take before it ends up in a fully developed spin? I believe it's three. Uh, or one, and, yeah, one to three. All right. So what's happening to our airspeed and our vertical speed as we are in the incipient phase? Is it going up or going down? So our airspeed would be going up as we're kind of transitioning to going down and our vertical speed would obviously be decreasing because we're going down. So right. To what point? Where is the airspeed going to stop at? So it's going to stop. I guess I don't really know what you're trying to ask there. Like a number. How level? fast are we gonna yeah, how fast are we gonna get? How fast is our airspeed gonna get? I guess I don't really know. Yeah. I don't uh, Depending on which direction you're turning, it's either going to be slightly above or slightly below stall speed. Okay. Because where's the pitot tube? If the pitot it's tube's kinda... on your left and you're so spinning to the right, it's going to be slightly above stall speed. If you're spinning to the okay. left, it's going to be slightly below stall speed, right? Okay. Um, easiest way to think of spins. Have you ever seen a maple leaf fall out of a tree? Yeah. That's an aircraft spin. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Imagine being an ant and like stepping on the front of that maple leaf. What's going to happen? Then no stop open. spinning. Yep. All right. Um, fully developed, right? When we're in that fully developed phase, our vertical speed and our airspeed are going to stabilize, right? Okay. That's how we know we've entered that fully developed phase is because we're no longer seeing a change in airspeed and vertical speed. Okay. Um, unless we start wiggling sticks, right? right. Um, talk me through a recovery. So caps. No. <laughs> I mean, technically that's how we're supposed to do it. <laughs> Power idle ailerons, neutral opposite rudder, and then elevator back. Elevator briskly forward. You got to break the oh, stall. Break Remember the, stall then the recovery when... on that's why I meant on the recovery briskly back. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> why are we bringing the power to idle? So power to idle we do that, um, I guess, so it doesn't increase airspeed too much. I'm not 100% sure, honestly. Well, that's, we need to start having a better understanding of aerodynamics. So when we end up in a, in a, or not necessarily when we end up in a spin, but when we have, when we apply power to an airplane mm -hmm. where the engine is mounted below the center of gravity, where does the mm -hmm. nose go? If it's below the center of gravity, it's going to go, at, oh, it's, yeah, it's going to go up, up. right? Um, cause it's just like you pulling on the bottom of the airplane, right? So if I pull right here, where does the airplane go? Goes it up. goes up, right? So if I have an airplane with the, uh, <clears throat> so if I'm in a spin, which means I'm stalled, which means my angle of attack is up too high. Mm -hmm. If I leave the power in, is the nose ever going to come down? No, no. Right. So that's why we bring the power out. We also have all those left turning tent or sorry, the FAA calls them turning tendencies now. Um, we also have all those turning tendencies um, that are going to exacerbate our spin. Right. right. If I have a bunch of power in on a propeller that spins to the right, the airplane's going to just want to spin to the left even more. So if you add that power, what's going to happen to our rotation rate? It's going to increase. It's going to increase. What do you think is going to happen to 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 you? You're going to go night night. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you ever seen Top Gun where they're like, yo, you're at a flat spin goose. I've never seen Top Gun, so I don't really understand the reference, but a lot of people understand it apparently. Um, <clears throat> all right. So that's why we pull the power out. So we don't end up like goose. Okay. Yep. Uh, why do we keep our ailerons neutral? Why can't I just bank out of a spin? 
So in a stall, typically our ailerons lose its effectiveness. Um, so you can't really bank to get out of a stall. So we just put them to neutral. So when we on that recovery, we recover to neutral. basically. Okay. On the so what's going to happen if I try to bank out? You could worsen it. I mean, I'm going to worsen it. I'm going to increase my rate of rotation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, pretty much anytime you do the wrong thing, you're going to increase your rate of rotation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, now you said rudder opposite rotation. You're IFR rated. Have you like, you've flown around in the clouds, right? Yeah. Or is it yeah. all under the hood? I've flown around the clouds. I don't okay. have too much. I got a couple, like an hour and a half or something. Actual. All right. My first hour of, or like my first 15 minutes of actual is through a sandstorm on an ILS. Uh, right. <laughs> it was, it was fun. Um, but, um, can you tell which way is left or right or up or down when you're in the soup? No, no. So which rudder do you press? So you're going to step on the ball, I would say. Okay. Do you have any? Well, no, this is the one time you're not going to step on the ball. Um, cause in a spin, all forces are going into the spin. Right. right? So, you would, so if you step on the ball, you'd worsen it. So you would worsen yeah. it. Right. Um, do you actually have a ball? So we don't, but we have a little line. <laughs> okay. Have you ever spun an aircraft with a glass instrumentation? I have not. No, they don't work. They don't. The G 1000 will shut down. It just goes black. <laughs> It nice. declutters and then goes black. Um, so which oh. way, which rudder do you press? Um, Let's think about the aerodynamics of it. What's happening? Let's stop think functioning inside a vacuum. Let's function outside as the airplane and the extension of our body. What is happening to the tail? If we're spinning, what's happening to the well, rudder? The rudder would be kind of going out, I guess. The rudder is going to be pinned, right? Yeah. So okay. what's going to happen to your pedals? They're going to be pinned. Right. So are you going to press the pedal that's bottomed out? Or are you no, going to press the pedal that's fighting you? Fighting you. Yeah. All right. Um, so think through the aerodynamics of, you know, think through of what's happening, right? In a, in a, in a commercial environment, you really got to start extending your body, your proprioception out to the size of the aircraft. Um, cause you can start flying some big stuff now. Right. Um, <clears throat> And we really need to understand the avion or not the avionics, but the aerodynamics at play in these kind of emergent situations. Mm -hmm. Right. And the fact that your rudder is so tiny, that's kind of why the Cirrus doesn't recover. It has a tiny little rudder. It doesn't, it doesn't recover. Yeah. Um, it can't apply enough force, you know, go next time you go on an airliner, go look at how big the damn rudder is on those oh, things. Yeah. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so elevator briskly forward. It was pretty straightforward. Let's break the stall. Right. So why is your prop twisted? So that just makes it so it has basically an equal amount of thrust throughout it. So the angle of attack is more aggressive towards the hub of it, and it kind of lessens as it goes out. And that is because the outside of that propeller is moving a lot faster than the inside of your propeller. Yeah, that's it, right? So why are wings twisted or at least on your aircraft your aircraft the wings are slightly twisted right they have a they've got pretty much the same twist as your prop right and i think even on your things you have like some aileron dams and all kinds of other weird stuff we're not going to get into those things um but your wing root mm -hmm. has a higher angle relative to the body or the fuselage than your wing tip I believe you're talking about our cuffed wing. I think is that what you're trying to refer to? No, it's not. A cu cuffed wings are different, right? They've got they've got like stall dams and whatnot on them. What I'm talking about is just the fact that the wing, right? If I was to mm -hmm. grab this wing, it's slightly twisted. Hmm. You know why? Um, I have not heard that before, but my assumption would be the stalling characteristics to increase. Uh, so it would stall towards the wing root, other than the tip. All right. That's awesome. Cause you looked at an aircraft and looked at its wing shape and said, okay, this airplane's going to function in this manner compared to this manner. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's really how you can check if somebody has got a decent grasp of, of aerodynamics of, of <clears throat> how different wings function based on their shape. 
Okay. When I first got my airplane, I had like five hours in a lake. Definitely not a Lake 200. I had no, I mean, if we're going to be honest, I had no business buying this airplane, but I looked at the wing and was like, okay, I've got a super fat wing, a lot of dihedral. Um, how's this aircraft going to function? Well, it's going to function really stable. It's going to generate a lot of lift at low speeds. Um, it's going to be easy to get off the ground, but it might float. And that is all stuff that I figured out just purely by looking at the shape of the airplane. Right. Um, <clears throat> now you've heard of overbanking tendencies, right? Overbanking tendencies. So uh, if you crank this thing over to like 45, 50 degrees of bank, where's the plane going to continue to go? Is it going to try to level back out or is it going to continue on? Oh well, yeah. It's going to have kind of like a negative stability effect to worsen. The yeah. So it's got that negative stability. Do you understand why? Um, so I believe when you're kind of like established in that turn, I believe it's just centrifugal forces or something around that. I'm honestly not sure. No. So, um, again, think of the, the think of how the wings are, 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 are moving through the air. Which wing is moving faster? So it would be the outside wing would be moving right. faster. Do I generate so more or less lift on a wing that's moving faster? Be making more lift, which I guess would worsen that bank. And that's exactly it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it's just like when you start kicking on the rudders, right? If you just kick the left rudder, the airplane's going to turn to the left. And then as that right wing speeds up, it's going to start rolling you to the left. Okay. Same idea, right? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> how is, um, air density really going to, to impact? And I know this feels like a really dumb question, but you know, the amount of people that, <laughs> the, the amount oh. of people that, that, that struggle with air density. So the more dense the air, the better the performance um, on like the airfoils are just physically more air. And as you go up in altitude, the less air, the less density, the worse the performance. Yep. Awesome. Now, what does humidity have to do? How does humidity impact an aircraft? So the higher the humidity, it actually makes the air kind of like a little bit less dense now that's because the water particles get in there and they take up a lot of space so that decreases the density of the air and worsening performance yeah engines don't run on water that as well <laughs> yep <You're> right. <laughs> yep um what are some of the benefits you've got a fuel injected airplane what are some of those benefits of a fuel injected airplane so i mean one of the big advantages is just not having a carburetor so we don't have carb icing as a possible risk case um, as well as that, has better of a throttle response. It's easier to start in cold weather. Um, it's typically more fuel efficient. Um, I believe that's the main ones. All right. Now you said we're not susceptible to carburetor icing. Is there any other kind of icing we might sus be susceptible to in the you know when it comes to fuel injected airplanes? Yeah. So it's just our main air vents could ice up basically, and we have right. a. Um, we have a lever we can pull to open some cowlings to counteract that. So, okay. Um, so you have an alternate air source, lever, we do have an alternate right? Air you have an alternate air source. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Now <clears throat> talk me through, uh, the turning tendencies, please describe to me the different turning tendencies and how they impact your aircraft. Are we not calling them left turning tendencies anymore? <laughs> no, because technically, I mean, if we if we think about some of them, are they all always left turning? I guess not necessarily. All right, all right. So, so it's it's go ahead. Yeah. So we got gyroscopic precession. We got torque effect. We got um, p factor and spiral slipstream. Okay. All right. Well, so we... describe to me gyroscopic <laughs> precession. Yep. So that's just the principle of a propeller, which almost acts as like a gyroscope in our situation. When a force is applied, the force is um, felt 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. Um, that is most evident on tail dragger airplanes. When they're lifting up that back, that's when it's more felt. All right. Now, oh yeah, you figured it out. Yep. So spiraling slipstream, that was pretty straightforward. Um, P factor. Yeah. Describe P factor to me. So P factor, uh, this has to do with our propeller and, um, on its down our it's downstroke, which is on the right side of the airplane. It ha takes a 
larger body of the air because they have a lar larger angle of attack. Therefore, it generates more lift and causes it to yaw to the left. Now, if I put the nose down, is that still the same thing? So, P factor is felt mostly at high angles attack. Um, so, it would not be as evident. No, it's not going to be necessarily as evident if I push the nose down, but is it still going to be a left turning tendency if I push the nose down? Um, Sorry, I'm thinking gyroscopic procession. Gyroscopic procession sw sw dir swaps direction when you push the nose down. That's okay. why we call them. Uh, we're not calling them left turning tendencies. Uh, let me go to your nav log real quick. And it is... Connor? Cameron. Cameron. All right. Oh, wrong email address. Oh, yeah, this is the... Yeah, this is the four flight one. That's why uh, I sent. I, oh, I did send you a nav log. Oh, yep, there it is. Awesome, awesome. All right, let me open up Sky Vector just so I can make sure we're all on the same page. All right, so we're going SFB K M K Y. I'm just trying to take a peek at your actual nav log, trying to get some of the same points that you are thinking. Yep. All right. Oh, you got real accurate with those with that that fuel burn. Is this just copy from Four Flight? Or did you actually use an E6B nope. for that? E6B, yeah. Oh, all right. Um, I mean, I'm... Oh, that seems fine. Let's dig through... Um, let's dig through Sky Vector real quick. I'm going to share the screen with you. Um... Sorry, I don't pay for Discord, so... it. Let me know if you need me to <laughs> zoom in farther. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so do you good. see it? Yep. All right. Um, <clears throat> what do you need to do if you want to cross this? So that's our eight is. So if we're departing VFR, we'll have to be in a DVFR flight plan. Um, we'll have to make position reports while penetrating the eight is. And we'll have to have our ADSB and mode C transponder as well. Awesome, awesome. What about IFR? IFR, um, if we're not in a radar environment, we'll still have to make those position reports. But an IFR flight plan can is suitable to go through the ADAS. And we'll still have to have that mode C transponder and ADSB. Awesome, awesome. Um, <clears throat> let's get into some stuff that you probably haven't been asked since private pilot. What <laughs> airspace is on the ground here? That's going to be Echo. All right, up to? It'll be up to, uh, let's see, is there anything above it? Nope. So just be up to 1,200, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, 1,200. Okay, so which one's the uncontrolled Actually, airspace? So it's 2,500 there because it's an extension of the Delta, I believe. So what airspace is on the ground right here? Golf. Up to? 1,200. All right. So, even though this is a cutout from oh. the... so <laughs> It goes up to... So All right. <laughs> All right. Um, 
<clears throat> what are, so we already said this is Delta, right? Mm-hmm. How do I get a clearance into Delta? How do I know that I am allowed in this airspace? So you just need two-way comms. So if they say your call sign, that will be considered two-way com- comms. All right. Um, can I use these for navigation? Or is it a recommended idea? No, no. Those are military training routes. All right. So what's the concern with military training route? Uh, so fast moving military aircraft, basically. Oh, so and, oh, huh. yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. What's this? That is a wildlife area. All right. So what's, what's it telling me? What do I need to do? You should stay above what is 1200 feet. 2000, um, 2000, 2000. Is that a requirement or a request? a request all right yeah but if you keep flying low over there and there's now there's a bunch of bald eagles that won't mate because you terrified them who's going to be in trouble <laughs> you're going to be in trouble <laughs> all right why is this one dotted i'm not sure sometimes water sometimes water okay all right so if i'm flying along should i use should i use this as a waypoint no because you're not sure if there'll be water or not. i'm not sure if there's going to be water there um, can I go in here? If I got permission. All right. Um, how would I get permission? Contacting the controlling agency. All right. Where would I find that? So sometimes it's on the chart. Sometimes it's in the chart supplement. All right. What's this anchor? That is a sea base. Yeah, probably, probably, maybe I, I've flown <laughs> to a bunch of them and then they never fucking exist. <laughs> it's just a way to the a lot of people got private seaplane bases put at their lake near their play near their house or their cabin or what have you, so that the neighborhood, the county, the town couldn't tell people they couldn't land there because it's a federally <laughs> mandated uh, base now. Nice, <laughs> that's great. Kind of a kind of a kind of a sneaky way to do it, mm-hmm. right? Um, now, what about here? This is a Bravo airspace, mm-hmm. right? What do I need to enter this airspace? So we need full permission to enter. Um, so we need to be cleared into the Bravo airspace along okay. with we do near mode C transponder, ADSB, all that good stuff. All right. So talk me through it, right? So I'm the ATC controller. Pretend that you're on the radio. Get a clearance mm-hmm. through this Bravo. All right. So I would start, let's say, um, I'll make a example of something we would do. Bucky or Orlando approach, Bucky 400, 10 miles north of Lake Apopka, um, transitioning northbound, requesting clearance through Bravo, something like that. All right. Uh, Bucky 5 whatever, uh, Squawk 5121. 5121. All right. Bucky uh, blah, 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 radar contact. Are you cleared into the airspace now? You are not cleared in. Nope. Awesome. Awesome. Um, now, <clears throat> God damn. What was your plan? Talk me through your plan. All right. So we're here. Yes. So actually, yeah. so we start at Stanford, I guess. So you'd go back up other airport. Oh, is that not where I'm at? SFB? Nope. That's KMY down there. Oh, I see what you're doing. I'm going the wrong direction. Yep. <laughs> I was thinking we were going. Yeah. All right. So talk me through this. Okay. Ooh, what's that T mean? Uh, it goes up to the top of the Bravo. Top of the Bravo? Or the top of the underlying, like the shelf, I guess. It goes top. up, it goes to the bottom of the overlying Bravo. Yeah. All right. Well, it goes to the top of the Bravo? That's interesting. Oh. <laughs> Tell me more. Tell me more, please. All right. Continue on. All right. So, I mean, transitioning our airspace, we're on approach pretty much the entire time. VFR. Um, my first waypoint was at Lake Apopka um, to your left. Yeah, I got it. Just. Yep. So it's a pretty big lake. So I used the North Shore, but yeah. Um, yeah. And then we're vectored pretty much the entire time until we leave the Charlie. So <laughs> who knows if we'll end up where we're supposed to be. But and then from there, we're going to Lake Louise, which is just south of Lake Apopka. Got it. 
And then, let me see. Let me pull my four flight. Then from there, we're going to uh, I-4. Might be, oh, you, know, you can kind of see it. Nope, it's going to be more north. Got it. Yep, right there. Now, let's talk about this waypoint. Um, mm-hmm. How do you know, like, roads, they're great. I like to follow them, not cross them. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Is there anything else you could use that might give you a better idea of exactly where you are when crossing this road? Let's see what I used. My exact crossing point. Um, so I crossed pretty much directly, I guess, parallel to that one little city over there, I guess, with the little flag. Okay, so that's visual. a visual that's a that's a visual flag, right? So that's not that's not terrible. Uh let's say I don't know, that's uh, that's not that close, right? Let's say we got like four mile visibility, right? That's still VFR. Mm-hmm. Can I see this town and this flag? Most likely not. No. Nope. All right. So what else could I use to positively identify this place? So let's see. There's a couple of smaller lakes we could possibly use. We got Grass Lake. Or I could use right a VOR. It. We could use a VOR as well. Yeah, I was like, um, I, I, got... I could just use a VOR. I know you're 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 so used to like when it comes to a VFR flight plan, yeah. you're saying like I need to stare at the ground. I need to look at the ground, right. right? No, like you can still use like nav radios, right? I know you probably are never using anything but GPS, given that it's a Cirrus and it's got an autopilot and it's got yeah. glass and like, but don't lose those skills on navigating via. VOR. How do you think I got my airplane home in hard IFR from Kansas to Wisconsin? I flew <laughs> VOR to VOR. Nice. <laughs> if you ever want to go buy your own airplane and you don't hit the lottery, that's probably what you're going to end up having to do. 100%. All right. Um, so don't forget those, those skills. Use right. it. Right. Where else are we going now? We're gonna be to the le- or to the right of Bartow Executive Airport. Um, All right. So just outside the airspace, or just in it? I mean, we're cruising at six thousand five hundred. Right. Yeah, that's good. And then from there, we're shooting down. So it's it's kind of hard to see on the VFR, but there's a couple mine like quarry icons. I see it. And- And from Google Maps, they look pretty big. So from there, we're pretty much parallel with Arcadia, the city. And there's also that small municipal airport in there. All right. And then from there, we're heading down to the city of LaBelle. So we're kind of shooting off to, um, to kind of avoid that Class Charlie airspace. I see it. Yep. LaBelle? And then it's pretty much straight shot home, right? Pretty much, yep. All right. Only thing I'd really say about this nav log is there are so many nav sources. Right. Use them. 100%. Right? Especially since you've got you've got an autopilot that'll track a needle, right? We do, yep. Right? You've got a VOR here and a VOR here. If you were really you know, you really wanted to make sure you were clear of that airspace. And then you would also have another nav source that could point you right to where you wanted to be. Right. Just follow the VOR. You could just fly the VORs. You're still looking out the pavement, right? Mm -hmm. Find some fixes that you can cross. That'll be off your left and right. And you've also got DME that comes off of these things. There's, there's so many tools that you can use when it's a VFR flight plan. It doesn't necessarily mean I need to only be VFR, right? Obviously visually I need to be in VMC conditions, right? Visually meteorological, visual meteorological conditions. Um, but use the skills, right? If all you're out here doing is flying VFR, when you go to take your multi-engine stuff and you have to practice your IFR stuff in multi-engine again, you're going to go, wait a minute, how the fuck do I load and approach again? Shit. Which way is two from? (laughs) Fox a two from indicator. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at these airports. Why is this one purple and this one's blue? So it has to do with, uh, well, blue is going to be your towered airport. Your magenta is going to be your non-towered. All right. What are these little blocks on the side? That means they have, um, 
guess the right word's not amenities, but they have like services. Yeah, we have services. There's probably gas there. Most likely, yeah. Yeah, there's probably going to be gas there. Um, why are these empty and these filled in? That's so, an empty one. That's a filled in one. That one's going to be a restricted airport right there if the R or private, sorry. Um, and then it also has to do with um, if it's paved or not. Awesome. Awesome. Um, let me think. Make sure there's nothing else weird on this. These sectionals that might be brought up. Yeah, there's no high wash anymore, so we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. Okay, that's the low end route. Make sure there's nothing weird on here. Oh, look, the key is right there. That's not in the way of anything. Um, <laughs> What is God? There's like no route. There's like no routes at all in Florida. <laughs> we do not have many VORs down here. No. Well, there's like two in the entire state of Wisconsin. So <laughs> you can do it better than us. All right. Um, <clears throat> what's the most accurate weather report? Most accurate, I guess, would be a METAR. It's going to be a PIREP. Or. Pyrep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Pyrep. That was a direct observation yeah. of the weather. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what's the difference between a report and a forecast? Forecast is predicting something. Um, and a report is obviously a reported weather. Yep. Report is what happened. Forecast is what might happen. What would you use this chart for? Um, that's kind of more of an overall chart and then maybe when you're going far distances um, just right. staying in the state of Florida I look at it and like oh we got high pressure we'll probably have pretty decent weather here for the next few days stuff like that what is the concern with this what is this called so it's a low, pressure, uh, low pressure system and then there's also an included front attached to it All right. Um, so with low pressure we have bad weather typically alright now, with it being an occluded front, is mm -hmm. there any concern of any other kind of, you know, the shape almost gives it away. Is there any concern of like, um, when you start getting to occluded fronts and you get this low pressure and this rotation in it, we can start getting cyclones. We can start getting tornadoes. We can start getting okay. the, the really bad weather associated with it, right? And it, again, they like to stick around because you've got all these forces not moving them right right mm -hmm. so we see these really tight bars what are these bars called those are iso bars so that's what a they... line of pressure all right so i see these really tight ones together what am I, what's that depicting uh high winds no it's a strong pressure gradient oh, okay that could result in high winds okay yep right um what you're thinking is iso tacks those are direct measurements of wind. Okay. Right? Um, it's also showing like a strong change in wind, which could be associated with wind shear, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy with that. That's not the one I want. Where'd it go? I struggle to find this one because they changed uh, the damn website on me. Yeah, it's going to be under, I think you want under tools and then supporting imagery probably. Decision supporting imagery. So there we go. That is what I'm looking for. What's this? That is going to be a jet stream. Okay. What are these little lines? That's going to be the speed. Mm, nope. That's the flags. Oh. Flags. Oh, come on. Uh, it's not sh not getting any bigger. Um, so I've got my little flags, right? I've got my flags right here, mm -hmm. right? What are these little lines? Not sure. 
change in over 20 knots of speed. Okay. 20 knots or greater in speed. Um, what's this? The red scalloped. That's going to be your um, embedded um, cumulus clouds, basically. All right. What's so dangerous about an embedded thunderstorm? You don't know it's there. <laughs> All right. It's like hidden. All right. What are the three things you need for a uh, thunderstorm to occur? So you need a lifting action, moisture, and um, <laughs> lifting action, moisture, and then unstable air. All right. Awesome. Now, how far away do you think you should stay away from thunderstorms? Roughly 20 miles or more. Okay. Thunderstorms can throw hail 30 miles away. 30 miles. Okay. I'd stay 40. 40? Okay. Yeah. Um, depending on the height of it, right? Uh, up here in Wisconsin, you know, sometimes they could, you get a thunderstorm and they stay pretty small and they stay pretty localized. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case down in Florida. I haven't spent much time flying down in Florida. <laughs> can't have, think of a K, you know what? Let's do this. <laughs> well, let's look up JFK. Okay. Uh, and I know it seems stupid, but like we need to make sure we can still read weather, right? We're not, we're not yep. falling. We're, we're not using four flight as a crutch. Uh, can you read this weather to me? Yeah. So JFK airport um, on the 20th day, uh, 51 Zulu, um, winds are out of 260, 21 knots, gusting 31 knots, 10 statue mile visibility, scattered at 7,000, broken at 10,000, broken at 13,000, broken at 19,000, overcast at 25,000, um, temperature 6, um, dew point minus 4, um, altimeter 2975, 200.75, remarks, um, altitude, um, Sorry, not altitude. Um, dis, uh, precipitation discriminator, um, and it's automatic. Peak wind out of 270 at 32 knots. What time did that happen? At 39 Zulu. Awesome. Sea level pressure 10. Oh, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, at what altitude? Hmm. At what altitude, if there was visible moisture here, if there was rain, what altitude would you start to expect um, icing? If I just icing, said light rain. So it would be roughly two degrees per Celsius per thousand feet, so roughly about 3,000 feet. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> is there any time here where you might be concerned about icing, given that previous report? Um. See, just looking at the TAF. So there is light rain showers. Could possibly be bad for icing. All right. What time? Um, so it's a probability of a 30% chance at 18 Zulu on the 20th day to 24 Zulu on the 20th day. Awesome. You know how to read METARs and TAFs. Um, <laughs> And make decisions based on them. Um, the reason I say pie reps are, you know, again, the most accurate. Uh, I like the one at Salt Lake City because you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of turbulence over Salt Lake City, especially now, because um, you get all the wind blowing across the mountains. All right. Wind blowing right. across the mountains. What does that generate? Um, mountain wave turbulence. Mountain wave turbulence, right? So what is this pie rep telling me? And at what altitude? So turbulent, not negligible, ice negligible, um, weather, VMC, so good weather. Um, it's a DA-20 at flight level um, 10,500. Yep, flight level 10,500, right? The reason I bring up this one is that's a pie rep showing that the turbulence is gone. Does that yeah. really make any sense? We've been seeing a lot of turbulence over the Rocky Mountains over the last few months because of mountain wave turbulence, right? 
This is amazing that somebody gave this one. I didn't even plan for this. I just found, like, I really just typed it in and this wasn't a plan at all. But it's awesome that somebody gave this report because right now, like if this didn't happen, right? If this report didn't come out, if this pie rep didn't get made, mm-hmm. I would still assume mountain waves right now. Right. All right. So that's why oh. I bring up them being the most accurate weather reporting. Um, let's pick here. Load data. Where'd it go? What's this one? So it's going to be wind less than five knots and then three degrees Celsius. Awesome. Um, what's this one? So it's going to be two wind of two six zero at a hundred and two and then minus 50. Awesome. Um, what are your questions? Oh, sorry. Uh-huh. We still got aromatic to go through. Uh, when, should, <laughs> when do you need oxygen? Uh, oxygen. Oh, above 12,500. Oh, no, you're fine. I just closed the yeah. I just closed the screen sharing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you need um, oxygen above twelve thousand five hundred for more than thirty minutes. All right, so I pop up to twelve six. I hang out there for fifteen minutes. I pop back down for twenty minutes. I pop back up to twelve six. Am I good? So I mean, I'm. That's going to be like an accumulation. So any, if any time throughout the duration of the flight that you accumulate more than 30 minutes above that altitude. Awesome. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> continue on with the requirements. So then uh, above 14,000 at any point, you need to be on oxygen. Above 15,000, you need to be on oxygen and your passengers must be supplied with oxygen. All right. So I was cheap. I only bought the two cannula position for my... Uh... My Cirrus, you know, I hit the lottery, but not like the Powerball lottery. Like I hit like the <laughs> local lottery. All right. Um, so I could only afford a two person a two place oxygen system, but I got, I got crotch goblins in the back seat. Um, can I just have my passenger in the front seat, just hand the crotch goblins, you know, the oxygen periodically. Well, each person needs to have their own system. They need to have their own supply, not necessarily their own system, right? They all don't yeah. need their own bottle. Okay. Correct. But they all need access to the bottle. Do you know what the recommendations are for oxygen? They're in the um, aim. Above I, 10 at uh, night, above well, five, or sorry, above 10 at day and five at night. Yep. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, what kind of medical do you have? I have a third class. All right. Third class medical. Can you operate as a commercial pilot with a third class medical? Only thing I can do is be a CFI. Right. Um, well, and the reason behind that, do you understand the reason behind that? So the reasoning behind that in second class is more restrictive. So when you are acting as a commercial pilot, you are held to a higher standard. Well, the idea is that as a, the, the idea is that as a, as a CFI, you're not operating as a commercial pilot. You're operating as an instructor. You just happen to be in an airplane. You remember private pilot? How they said, Mm -hmm. hey, you can technically get paid to be a pilot as long as it's incidental to the business. Mm -hmm. That's what being a CFI is, is being incidental to the business. Mm. You you are a teacher. It just happens to be in an airplane. Okay. That's why you can do it. You could technically teach with no medical. Yeah. Okay. You know, I don't have a medical right now, but I could technically teach you commercial because you can act as PIC of the aircraft. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, now, <clears throat> now let's get into, let's say you've got a passenger. They're mm-hmm. freaking out. They're breathing way too fast. All right. They're high, uh, for lack of a better term, they're hyperventilating. What are you going to mm-hmm. do? So, um, the, the main one is your, your paper bag. You're going to want to try to get them. If you don't have one, you're going to try to get them to maybe sing a song, talk, try to calm them down, stuff like that. All right. You got a song in mind? I don't know. I could, the I could wheel, think of one. The, the row, 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 row your boat? 
row, row. Okay. Yeah, Everyone knows one. row, row, row your boat. All right. All right. And it is impossible to sing that shit fast. Like row, okay. row, row your boat. Like even, even then that was one long exhale, which is going to require a long inhale. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, wheels on the bus go round and round is another good one. Cause like wheels on the, but you can't, you yeah. can't do it. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's good to have that in mind because your passengers are going to start hyperventilating when something is going wrong and you're going to be focused on unfucking whatever is wrong. Yeah. Okay. So for example, when I, again, brought my airplane home, um, I was in hard IFR flying VOR to VOR and I had to navigate around a storm. Right. I was trying to get around a storm. I got on the wrong side of the, or I got on the opposite side of the storm from where the center I was talking to. And it, since I had dumpy radios from 1984, the storm blocked my radio. Nice. I couldn't get a hold of them. All right. I also looked at my iPad and would try and realized, or I looked at my, how long I had been diverting around this storm and uh, realized I don't have the gas necessary to get to my point of intended landing anymore. I need to divert. So I started looking for my approach plates. My iPad had apparently gotten signaled 20, 30, 40 minutes ago and had dumped my approach plates trying to download the new ones. Nice. So I try to do it on my phone. My phone did the exact same thing. So now I am in IFR with no approach plates and have lost communications. Do you think my passenger was doing very good? Probably not. <laughs> right? no. he, he was actually doing just fine. Uh, he had no idea what was going on. But if he had become aware of what was going on, I don't need to be trying to figure out what fucking song right. I want to tell him <laughs> to right. sing while I'm trying to squawk 7600, trying to get radio communications on 121.5, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so make sure, again, as a commercial pilot, you're going to have a lot more people in your airplane that... um well, you might have a lot more people in your airplane that aren't necessarily as comfortable with aviation. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right. What are the four types, before we finish this up, what are the four types of hypoxia? Hypoxic, hypemic, histotoxic, and stagnant. All right. What would cause hypoxic hypoxia? That's typically uh, due to altitude, high altitude. Right. Now, what about hypemic? Hypemic, that's typically due to carbon monoxide poisoning. All right. Is there anything else that could cause hypemic hypoxia? Like, really describe to me the functions that's happening. So, within hypemic hypoxia, the carbon monoxide binds closer to the blood cells than oxygen does. So, the oxygen can't be absorbed within the blood and causes the oxygen deficiency. All right. So, carbon monoxide is a perfect example right but just make sure you understand the, the mechanics at play and you do all right um what about stagnant hypoxia so stagnant hypoxia can be caused by a couple different ways um but basically it's the blood physically isn't moving throughout the blood so it can be caused by possibly like a blood clot or g-forces stuff like that all right um everybody sat on the toilet too long Nobody, nobody can lie and say, no, I do my thing. <laughs> no, we've all opened up TikTok on our phone and then our feet get tingly. Mm -hmm. That's stagnant hypoxia. Yep. All right. Um, now what about histotoxic? What'll cause a histotoxic, uh, what'll cause somebody to be histotoxic? Drugs and alcohol. All right. So if you've got a buddy that, you know, they vape and smoke and they're an alcoholic, but they want to go fly with you. Is there no. a concern? Well, I yeah. mean. So they can fly, um, but that increases the risk of hypoxia. So Right. Um, that's that whole like 5,000 feet or 5,000 feet oxygen at night kind of thing. They're going to mm -hmm. end up loopy if you don't, if they don't have oxygen above 5,000 feet. All right. You got any questions? I don't think so. Um, Chad, how about you? No. I enjoyed my uh, definitely never getting called on just sitting here listening. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, <clears throat> I'd say you understood your privileges and limitations as a commercial pilot. Pretty, pretty spot on. Um, just brush up on the difference between common carriage and private carriage. Um, easiest way to think of it is like when it comes to private carriage, did it get offered to the public? Mm -hmm. Right. If it did not get offered to the public, then it's not, it's not. So, I guess, uh, I guess a question kind of a little bit, but within your scenario, I was still, I was trying to debate if that was legal, 
No. Mm. I don't... Was that legal in that situation? Because my assumption would be no, because it was not my aircraft, right? Well, even if it's not your air... Oh, wait a minute. The Learjet? Uh, your mom. The, oh, your, no, 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 no. And that's the thing. Even if it's your personal aircraft, you're not going there for a common purpose. Okay. Right? Like, technically, right? <laughs> I know this seems a little stupid, but if my wife's name wasn't on our airplane and I flew mm-hmm. her to Green Bay to drop her off for work or I flew her to her base to drop her off for work and mm-hmm. she put gas in the airplane... That's technically private carriage. Not a common purpose. Well, yeah, exactly. It wasn't a common purpose. Now, like, could it be argued that I was taking her to work and the common purpose is us not losing our fucking house? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But when you yeah. think of it as plain black and white as that, you're not going to get yourself in trouble. Right. Right. And that's really the big takeaway is preventing you from violating a regulation inadvertently because most people don't intend to break the law. Right. Um, yeah. Now, if you wanted to go fly an SR 22, the turboed model, what else would you need? I need my high performance endorsement. Awesome. Awesome. Um, but yeah, if you ain't got any other questions, you know, no, I don't yeah. think I Chad, anything else? No. I'm no. Good over here. All right. Enjoy y'all enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Appreciate you it as well. Yep.